Now, the, this this notion of being in orbit around the Earth is is where I started finding murkiness and lack of clarity. We know that they're not allowed in no WMD in a full orbit, you know, where they're going to go the whole way around the Earth. And the language is pretty clear that ICBMs are not forbidden. First of all, they're not stationed. Next, they're not in orbit. And we had M Ambassador Goldberg testifying that the uh, treaty doesn't apply to things on the ground, and they start out on the ground before they go to their destination. So they are, um, they're allowed under the treaty, and that's strong consensus there, especially when you start looking at um, state practice over time. United States and Soviet Union, all Russia today, all have ICBMs. But we, we, we lost the bubble on the partial orbit. The Soviets built 18 silos in the 60s for their fractional orbital bombardment system. And they said it complies with the treaty because when we would send, a, when we the Soviets send a, a nuclear warhead your way, it will only be in orbit for a little bit of time. In other words, its instantaneous impacts point will leave the surface of the Earth and it will in fact be falling around the Earth, which is how the physicists talk about being in orbit. But and then we will redirect it and head it your way. And they built this because apparently we had all our early warning systems, and I would defer to any of you for correcting me on my history here, but we had all our early warning systems looking over the pole at Russia, and so they would have used their fobs to come in from the south, and we would have been very surprised. So um, the interesting thing is they, they started testing and building these things in the early 60s, prior to passage of the Outer Space Treaty. So um, I'm curious, and Henry and I have discussed this, as to whether we knew about it. And if we did know about it, then that helps you interpret the, the, the pr prohibition on orbital nu um, nuclear weapons one way. And if we didn't know about it, you could maybe take a different position. Now, the Chinese are currently testing um, fractional orbits for hypersonic glide vehicles. Now, they're not testing it with nuclear warheads, but I assume you could put them on after you finished your testing. Um, then lastly, and what I found most interesting is that there's DOD, Office of the General Counsel, legal assessments saying that those are legal, that, that fractional orbits with nuclear warheads are compliant with the treaty. Next slide, please. So, um, the next issue that I thought was a tad unclear, and I am uh, supported in this by a, a scholar from uh, McGill University, which has a big space law program, and Nicholas Mott was uh, the chair of the Air and Space Law Department there. Uh, well, when it says, we undertake not to place these things, um, install such weapons on celestial bodies. Well, most of the treaty, whenever it says celestial bodies, it says the moon and then other celestial bodies. And here, the moon gets left out. Well, um, Professor Mott was very concerned about this and because if you're not mentioning the moon, then maybe you can only not put the these weapons on Mars and other planets. But what about the moon? Um, so, under the rules of interpretation, we should assume the exclusion is deliberate. One of the things the Supreme Court has said is you don't go adding words to treaties, you don't go taking them out. You read them as, read them as written. So, um, however, there are other strong indicators that the drafters included the moon as a celestial body because th in other parts of the treaty and in the title it says the moon and other celestial bodies. So. The moon must be one too, but why did they always say it in other places? But they didn't say it here. So you could, you could get yourself in a knot wondering about this one. Um, but if you go to the end of the sentence, you'll see that putting WMD on the moon looks like stationing. In other words, you're stationing them in outer space. So um, that's why they're forbidden on the moon, and that's why we've seen DoD's attorneys in public statements say 
no, no WMD, no nukes on the moon. Um, stationing probably also includes lunar orbit and orbit around other celestial bodies. Next slide, please. All right, now here's, here's Henry's favorite, where is outer space? Because if we're not supposed to station such weapons in outer space in any other manner, where is it? Well, there are things where we do know some things are in outer space. We know that an object in orbit is in outer space. There was pretty strong consensus on that in the testimony to the Senate. And um, we know the moon is in outer space. We also know airspace is not. And um, the question is, where does it start? And we have very adamantly for decades just said we don't want to say where it starts. And I think that's a good thing. <laughs> you, if someone sends something over your country, you're going to claim your airspace extends all the way up to reach them. And if some, and if you're flying over someone else's country, maybe you think you're in outer space. So there's very good sound reasons to avoid answering that question for as long as possible. But I will say, and you can ask me in questions, um, when I was at the FAA, someone tried to write that something extended to infinity and I had to say, uh, no, no, <laughs> can't say that. So um, sovereign airspace goes up quite a ways further than regulated airspace. 